Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. Happy to be with you. I'm broadcasting from beautiful southern New Jersey, uh, away from home, away from Happy Valley for the week, but uh, still going with a couple episodes of the Lions 24-7 podcast. But we've got another one coming for you later in the week. I think you really enjoy the guests we've lined up for that one. I think you really enjoy the guests we have lined up for this one. Just a little bit later, we have Tyler Calvaruso hopping back on board. Of course, our recruiting and transfer portal insider at Lions247.com has done a great job with the comings and goings on the roster. And now we've got a new coaching staff member to look into. We will discuss the recruiting impact of Marcus Higgins, along with uh, what he may bring to this staff in terms of regional opportunities in just a little bit with Tyler Calvaruso, along with the latest on Penn State recruiting. They had a bunch of visitors on campus this past weekend. We'll hear a little bit about that. Same thing shaping up for this upcoming Saturday, uh, the third Saturday in a row where Penn State set to host a bunch of prospects and, and predominantly those 2024, 2025 recruits are in the spotlight there. But we begin with a 24-7 sports colleague who does a fantastic job covering all things UVA and uh, was all over the Marcus Higgins uh, situation as it developed here into Monday morning. Uh, and as that story broke, and uh, Jackie Franchuli joins us right now on the Lions 24-7 podcast. And Jackie, I know things are busy for you. You've now got the, the wide receivers coaching search passed over to you now from <laughs> us. So good luck with yours. Um, there were a lot of names that, that people honed in on and, and kind of paid a lot of attention to, maybe went through some bios along the way in the last week since Taylor Subblefield was relieved of his duties about nine days ago. Ultimately, it's Marcus Hagans, who you are very familiar with. We were just talking before you recorded your first time covering recruiting all in was 2013. And, and that was his first time as a full-time position coach at Virginia. He played there. He was a quarterback, uh, played some wide receiver. He was a wide receiver in the NFL, emergency quarterback in the NFL for a few years and ultimately getting into the coaching staff, of uh, you know, part of his career does it back home at UVA breaks in 2011 as a graduate assistant has a really rapid rise to that position coaching job. And Jackie, he has spent a decade as Virginia's wide receivers coach. So let's start here generally as you saw this thing developing and, and, and as you got confirmation that it was trending toward him leaving the program, coming up here to Penn State, what was your first takeaway? Sure. Actually, when the Penn State job opened, I had already started looking into possibly if you wanted maybe that was a job that he would be interested in because of his connection to the program through Anthony Poindexter. Obviously, his son is named after Anthony Poindexter. They're really connected. They coach on the same team under Mike London. They were both assistants together. So there was that connection already. So I thought, okay, if my if Marcus Higgins was going to go to another program, this job opening would be it. He's turned down power five position coach positions before. You know, he he was named one of the candidates for the South Carolina job a few years ago. So he it's it's not like he jumps at the first opportunity he's really meticulous on which jobs he offers because he loves the virginia program i mean his family is all uva his wife is a former virginia women's basketball player and they're so involved in the uva community community i mean his sons he's got two jackpot and christopher are really involved with the athletic program they're always there cheering other programs around you see you know i was at a women's basketball game with my kids and i saw lauren Hagens with her two kids there cheering on the women's basketball program so they're really a tight-knit family, and they really involve the UVA community. So when this Penn State job opened, we started kind of looking around and talking to a few people, and it really started kicking up on Sunday night. That's when we heard that things were going to pick up because he was still on the road recruiting, so we weren't sure how far this along was going. Um, but then Sunday, that's when we started hearing some rumors. And this is such a great opportunity for Coach Higgins because before, again, he's been at UVA for years. And when you recruit for UVA, it is very different than if you recruit for a Penn State. For Virginia, there's so many restrictions when it comes to academics that although we know that Coach Higgins is a guy that can recruit very well, he's got so many great relationships in the 757, at, you know, Northern Virginia, North Carolina, actually some in Louisiana now because of some recruiting ties he's had with Dontavian Weeks and Dontavian Wicks and Keaton Thompson the last few years. So he's got some good connections. However, at UVA, sometimes you not you might not get that five or four star because of other reasons. So here at Penn State, you take away those reasons. So you, I know some people are going to stuck on the stars of who he's able to get at UVA. So that's why I'm kind of putting that little asterisk there so people understand. Because like a kid like Cameron Selden, which is a name that Penn State fans should be very familiar with, visited UVA because of Marcus Higgins. So UVA was even in the conversation because of him. They didn't end up coming to Virginia. But 
he was considering UVA because of Coach Higgins. So this is this is a guy who's very involved in UVA, loved by everyone in the program, and is certainly going to be missed. You mentioned the obvious connection with Anthony Poindexter, which I do want to get into a little bit later. But beyond that, I mean, you've mentioned it. They, they, there have been Power 5 programs that have come calling, I'm assuming, with pay raises, uh, maybe with other added titles. He's going to be the offensive recruiting coordinator and carry that title here at Penn State. We'll talk about that with our recruiting guy, Tyler Calvaruzzo, a bit later. But why else do you think that whether it's timing, opportunity, after so much time and, and growing so much roots down in Charlottesville, that he's ready to, to, to change that with his family? It's definitely timing. And, uh, you know, obviously this is a great opportunity because he's going to be joining his family. It's going to be, he's going to uproot his family and he's still going to have family there with Anthony Point Dexter and his family around. So it will be a little easier transition for his, his wife and his two kids, knowing someone else there, knowing their family so well. But honestly, you know, if you know what happened at Virginia back in November with the tragic shooting where three young men died and one was injured, Two of those young men were wide receivers. And if you know anything about the, the Hagen's family is that the wide receiver room becomes a family. And Lavelle Davis was one of those that was killed. And Davis was a young man that really connected with the Hagen's families. The two sons, Christopher and Jackpot, considered him a brother, like an older brother. And he was often over at the Hagen's family house, um, had dinner with them. When Marcus Higgins was on the road recruiting, Lavelle would be at these kids' baseball games. So that has been really, really tough for this family. I mean, if you walk around the McHugh Center in Virginia, you're going to see memories of, you know, where you talk to Lavelle, where you talk to Devin Chandler. So it's, it's hard. You know, Marcus Higgins had to take a, 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 like a few weeks off. I mean, he just got back to really being full-time on the trail again. I mean, it's been, it's been a rough for the Virginia community. And it really hit hard, the Hagen's family. So when this opportunity came, it didn't shock me that they needed a fresh start. They needed an opportunity just to kind of get away. So this was just a, a good timed opportunity. And it was an opportunity that they had at least some emotional and personal support as well when they make the next jump. Yeah, and I appreciate you answering that with, with such uh, – I mean, it's just a, such a delicate subject that goes so far beyond what we're used to covering. And I want to commend you as well for the coverage in November and beyond uh, that you did. And we're, we're called into action to perform. You know, it's something that I think all of us in the cover a team, you know, we, we were watching what you were doing and, and it trying to put ourselves in your shoes. And I just want to say you did a fantastic job um, in honoring those young men and honoring the community and, and covering it the best you could. Um, but turning attention back toward football here, um, you mentioned the five stars weren't necessarily showing up to campus uh, to, to be molded into talent. It was a lot of guys who carried that three star, you know, maybe outside of the top 100 wide receiver rankings at 24 seven sports. How has he been viewed as a developer, a developer of talent in that receiver room for these past nine, 10 seasons now? I mean, if you look at the record books for Virginia, most of those have been coached by Marcus Higgins. I mean, if you look at what Dontavian Wex was able to do in the 2021 season, it's remarkable. He, you know, he holds records for Virginia. He was, you know, now he's uh, been invited to the Senior Bowl. He's going to be at the NFL Scout Combine. That's the type of development that you see from him. Alamade Zacchaeus, who I believe is a Pennsylvania native, he was also one that was recruited by Virginia. He wasn't really well known. And he was also performed well for Virginia and it was a very great playmaker and quite successful and even went on. Um, he's still in the NFL. So he's been able to turn these guys that, you know, isn't going to be recruited by the Penn States, Alabama's or what have you, but he's been able to develop because that's what Virginia is. You need to evaluate and that's a developing type of program. So imagine what he can do. That's what we are now assuming now. Imagine what he can do with a four star, five star that has that speed and athleticism already there available um, and it can possibly win those one-on-one -on -one matchups that Virginia sometimes you have to scheme differently so you don't get those much one-on-one -on -one matchups so coach Higgins has been developing a lot of talent he's got a good eye for talent um, when you look at who's been able to recruit he can really pick who can be those diamond in the rough um, you know even on the defensive side I remember a recruitment for linebacker Chris Peace this is before the transporter early signing day so when that the area of January where you can actually see mm. those kids that didn't get early offers it's really hard for those kids now, but back then when he was, I think it was uh, 2015, when he was offered by Virginia, he was someone that no one was kind of talking about. It was Coach Hagen's connection to the 757 saying like, hey, this is a kid that UVA should look at. 
And then Mike London and his defensive staff went in there. But again, that was a connection that coach Marcus Higgins had. And that's, you know, right now, even like, you know, a kid like Anthony Riddick, who has a Penn State offer, he has that connection with Phoebus. So you're going to see that. You're going to see a lot of those connections. And the transfer portal connections are so important now. And he's able to continue seeing those connections and getting those kids are like, okay, I can develop him even more. So, and you saw that with Keaton Thompson, who is a former quarterback in college. So you're seeing a guy who's played quarterback at Mississippi State. They brought him over a uh, Bronco Mendenhall staff and he was going to be a quarterback. He got hurt. Brennan Armstrong won the battle and then he moved him to the wide receiver room. And that's when Marcus Hagans developed him into a wide receiver, teaching him what he needed. And he was, I think the only player on Virginia's offense that made and made a team all ACC team. So you can see those little glimmers there. What of Marcus Higgins potential. And if he gets a bigger platform, like Penn state, you can see his potential there. I know James Franklin wants to get him on some you know, planes, trains, automobiles, and, and wearing the Penn state logo now, and particularly down in that familiar territory when they send uh, uh, Marcus on the road and it's going to happen soon, if it's not happening already, what kind of a representation will he be for that program? And what do you think, you know, wearing that different emblem of a team that's projected to be inside the top 10 of national rankings next season could do for him to get things done at a higher level? I mean, it's first going to be weird for him. I mean, it's going to be the first time he's going to be wearing a UVA gear um, mm. without a UVA gear, apart from being an NFL player. I think that's the only time he's ever wear non-UVA colors. So for him, it's probably going to feel strange. And maybe even some coaches in high schools are going to be a little, uh, I guess, strange or spooked out by seeing him not in that orange and blue. But I, I think having that brand behind him will help him a lot because when you talk to certain players that he recruited, they always said the same thing. I I love UVA because of Coach Marcus Higgins. You know, Cam Seldon was an example that I just gave. UVA was in it because of him. You know, there was other things that if you talk to Cam, he was saying, I like, you know, Tennessee a little bit more because of this. I like Penn State because of this. But with for Virginia, it was always about Marcus Higgins. So you have that with four-star receiver, Chance Wiggins, a current recruit. You have three-star wide receiver, Makai White. You know, I thought that Virginia had a legit chance with both of them because they both had such a great relationship with coach Marcus Higgins. So that's the reason why I kept them even in our, I, I had a more, I had one of them in my mock class because I thought, Oh, his relationship with coach Higgins might sneak him into a Virginia class. But now that he's at Penn state, obviously I'm not as confident anymore when it comes to Virginia. Yeah, but I think having that brand, having the facilities that he's been able to promote, having to say like, Hey, we're competing for a shot at the big 10 championship. We're competing for college play playoffs. That's going to help him a lot. He doesn't have to doesn't have to sell the program or the brand as much. The brand just sells itself. And with Coach Marcus Higgs, with his relationship, you're able to get in guys early, um, cement. I mean, Penn State is a force here in the 804, 434, all the area codes in Virginia. You know, I live about 45 minutes from Richmond, and I still people still talk about James Franklin landing a helicopter at Verein at the CKV on Key. So having Coach Higgins and Point Dexter and having James Franklin, all of them so so into Virginia, it's going to be tough for a lot of other programs in the state to compete against that. And I, and UVA knows that too. And I wanted to finish up with that note on Poindexter because he's a guy, it looks like he's going to be with Penn State for year three. It felt like that second year was a bonus because this was the second straight winner that our reporting crossed paths. Of course, Poindexter solidly in that mix to become maybe that next head coach at his alma mater, former All-American down in Virginia. They go with Tony Elliott. That meant Poindexter sticks around for another year. Again, it looks like he is going to work in tandem with Higgins. It's really going to be compelling to see what they can do together on the recruiting trail. But how is this being internally, I guess, digested uh, by UVA, the fan base, the fact that Poindexter is not brought home and, and in the ensuing offseason, it seems that he has a big hand in taking a guy that a lot of people thought would never leave. Man, you're bringing up some bad memories. I'm sorry. I, I know I can fans. walk. I can walk away from this one. I guess a lot. No, 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 no. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's just uh, I, I've talked to a few Virginia uh, alums, alumni, the last 24 hours, and it, it it does hurt. I mean, they're all happy for the. I think this has been the key. They're all happy for the Hagen's family. They're all happy for their UVA family because, the, like I said earlier, this is a good fresh start for this family. So uh, everybody is supporting them. So I think that's been the key. Everyone is hurt because 
you know, it, it, you're losing someone that you've known for 10 years, like you opened up. I, he was one of the first coaches that I've met when I started for covering college football recruiting. Even when I went to go cover the Gators and the SEC, I still kept in contact with Marcus Hagans and his family. And even when, you know, when Florida and UVA faced in the Orange Bowl, the first thing I did when I got to the sidelines was I went to go say hi to Coach Hagans to get reunited. Um, so it is it is hard for UVA to say goodbye to him because, again, he's been involved with a lot in the community, not just in the UVA community, but Charlottesville, too. Their sons go to a local school. They're involved in community events. So, again, they're involved in the Little League teams. They're so involved with their kids. So not just UVA community is mourning. It's like Charlottesville community is saying goodbye to a family. So that's something that in Happy Valley and State College, you're going to have a family that's really involved with the community too. And then with Anthony Poindexter, when all the coaching search was happening last year, there's still some people that wish that Poindexter was a head coach. That's something that Tony Elliott is still having to live with is that there was sort of like, I guess you could have team shirts of team Elliott and team Poindexter. You still have people around still wanting, still wanting Poindexter back. So that's, that's kind of something that looms around the program. But everyone is still likes when their alma mater is being showcased on the national level and succeeding. Though know, they talk about Don Staley as a South Carolina women's basketball coach, they love seeing her success. Now they now speaking of all the success, they don't want them to have success on the recruiting trail. But that's going to be hard. Again, we talked about those two, and then there's other Virginia alums like Chip West over at Wake Forest. That this area is going to be very overwhelmed with former UVA coaches in the area. So that is something that these alums are not happy with, but they're happy that, that those two are having so much success. Because again, for them, it shows pride in UVA that those two guys are in a national brand too. Well, Jackie Franchuli, as you can tell, does a great job covering UVA for 24-7 Sports, our network. Happy to always uh, bring in a colleague from the network when something pops up like this. And thank you so much for keeping us in the loop and keeping us uh, kind of working in tandem there a Sunday night into Monday morning as this news was about to surface. So appreciate everything there. Good luck with your coverage of the wide receiver search uh, and, and, and everything that lies ahead for you this offseason. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Uh, big, big appreciation there because I think we all came away with a, a lot more uh, knowledge on Marcus Hagens, who is about to get started, uh, not just on the field in spring ball, but much sooner than that in the recruiting trail. And to help us break that down a bit more is Tyler Calvaruso uh, from Lions247.com. You're all familiar with him by now from the site and, of course, here on the podcast. Uh, Tyler, we know the wide receivers coach now. Uh, I know you were just listening to the tail end of that conversation with Jackie. Um, with all that in mind, what's the initial reaction from a recruiting perspective strictly for you coming out of these last 24 hours? So I think the best way for me to put it and how I feel about this hire is this. Penn State had a very heavy presence in Virginia this past cycle, right? We saw it with the guys they signed. Birch, Meyer, Rojas, Carmelo Taylor, KV Yankees. All those guys, I mean, what was it, six of the top ten players in the state wound up signing with Penn State. And that was without an assistant coach who had an open door at pretty much every school in Virginia, and that's what Marcus Higgins has from what I've been able to gather. Now, I'm not saying Penn State's going to be able to go down to Virginia and get every single kid it wants, right? That's just not the way recruiting works. There's going to be a ton of competition, as Jackie alluded to. There's a lot of Virginia alums work in the area for other programs, but – Marcus Higgins, from every high school coach that I've talked to in the area, is just so well respected, and they love and appreciate him as a person. It seems it just seems like he's so good at building relationships on a different level. And while this hire wasn't solely driven by recruiting, I think Penn State did a pretty good job of getting a guy who could help its recruiting efforts in the Tidewater area, the seven five seven. I think you're going to see things kind of go to the next level in Virginia now. When you we when we talk about that tandem of, of Poindexter and uh, Higgins, and I was just discussing that with Jackie for a while, but I think people need to understand how much legwork Jaywan Sider does yes, in Virginia. I know yes. he is so associated with Florida, and like everyone that pops up, whether they're in Tampa or Miami or Jacksonville, everyone says, "Go get him, Jaywan Sider." Keep in mind, he does a ton of work. And if you go down the commitment list, now their signee list in 2023, up at 247.com, look at who the primary and secondary recruiters are. A lot of guys involved on both sides of the ball is Jay Wan Sider. So I just want to make that note. But as yes. we talk about Poindexter, a former All-American down there, a guy who was seriously considered to be the next coach at Virginia, and then Marcus Higgins, it sure seems like if he stuck around Charlottesville enough, he may have become the head coach down there someday. Those guys now are on the staff here in Happy Valley. 
they're going to have access to a lot of recruiting resources to make sure they can get down to familiar territory whenever they can. How do you think this cycle immediately Penn State's going to benefit? I think it's really strength in numbers, right? And we're talking about now, we've gone from two to three guys. I know Taylor Stubblefield had his fair share of connections in Virginia as well. I don't want to sell him short in that regard. But we're talking about three guys now who could really go out and potentially dominate Virginia. And I think given where Penn State's board is, especially at wide receiver right now, that's huge. Because we're talking about Keelan Adams, who is arguably the top wide receiver on the board right now. He's the top 100 kid out of Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach is an area where Penn State would really like to improve on the trail, on the trail, excuse me. And Hagen's just having him on board helps with that so much. That's the that's the sentiment that I've been hearing repeatedly. Virginia Beach, this is an area where Hagen's is really going to contribute. And when you got a guy like Keelan Adams, who's already so high on the board, and now you bring in a guy like Hagen's, who knows Adams already. It's big for Penn State. And the same goes for his, uh, his, his green run teammate, to Sean Young. Steve, he's, he's known Hagen for a while as well. And Chance Wiggins, I got the chance to talk to him yesterday. He's over in King George, so a little bit out of Hagen's area, but good relationship there as well. You know, they, they, he's known him for a while, offered him at UVA. And he was telling me it's, it's a really big deal that Penn State hired him as its next wide receivers coach. So, could it pay instant dividends? I think there's a good chance it can, man. I, you know, we got a long way to go with a lot of these guys. They're going to go out and make their visits. But when you could go out and get a wide receiver coach who already has relationships within place with some of your top targets at receiver, this is big. It's a big deal. Wiggins and Adams, not only do they have the uh, the top 24-7 uh, annotation uh, as, as a part of their, their prospect profile, which is always nice, but they also have – the recent history of traveling up to visit yeah. Happy Valley. And on top of that, and now they learn that there's someone they're comfortable with as the position coach here. Now there's a bit of a whiplash scenario playing out for prospects. And I understand it. I've seen it play yes. out in person before when they sit down on a couch in Taylor Stubblefield's office. And then all of a sudden 48 hours later, they're told that that Taylor Stubblefield is no longer part of the plan at Penn state. There's some whiplash there. Um, but, to be able to plug this position, and we were wondering, would it be a guy who had you know connections to part of the footprint here in the recruiting area, or would it be someone who maybe they were going to look to strength in a different part of the country? That was a bit of a wild card in this discussion. They clearly got someone who fits a lot of what they want to do within a region they're familiar with. And so what do you think? Is there any kind of a spot where Penn State has to push pause or slow down, or is it full steam ahead for them? Because a lot of times we've seen it other positions when they've had to replace guys there's a bit of a gap. Maybe it's in the entire spring for you. Maybe it's a couple of months where, where it squanders some opportunities. Do you think they can hit this in stride and avoid any kind of hiccup? Because that often comes with a position change on the recruiting trail, just the way it is. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's kind of a combination of the two in this situation. I view this as kind of a unique situation, just given what we just talked about, how Hagen's already having a relationship with so many guys who are priorities, right? That's, a, that's the thing we need to emphasize here. The guys that Hagen's has relationships with, the Virginia guys specifically, they're priority guys. So Penn State could hit the ground running in that regard. Now, outside of his region that he's used to, I think he's going to have to take a step back and kind of, you know, look at the board, watch some tape, evaluate how is this guy going to fit, and get to work on building those relationships. And one guy yeah. who I think he's going to get to really emphasize doing that with is Josiah Brown from Long Island. He was on campus over the weekend without Higgins in place, and he had a really good visit. Brown's a very, very high on Penn State's board. They like what he brings to the table, and I think that's going to be a relationship that Higgins really emphasizes building. And that's going to go for a lot of other guys as well. But when it comes to the guys in his area, you could hit the ground running, and then guys outside of the area, maybe take a step back, evaluate, figure out what direction you want to go, and decide, hey, look, who am I going to really focus on building these relationships with, and who are some other guys, you know, might not really fit what I'm looking for. That's the other fascinating part of this. Um, I mean, guys that we've been talking about as, as guys who are Penn State priorities, they may now feel things cool off with the program based on what the new wide receivers coach has seen, based on what he wants to add to this room, and based on the way he envisions this room growing for the next three years. And there may be some other guys who maybe we, we've kind of put on the back burner or we've, we've pivoted away from that. You just wonder, could things could things spark in one way or the other? I know there were some questions about Tysir Denmark, who, I mean, you and I will tell the world, is a fantastic, fantastic wide receiver right, prospect right. out of Philadelphia. Right now, he's committed elsewhere. Uh, and people want to know, is this kind of the, uh, something that can move the needle? One, I think it's really hard to say right now. you got to let the guy make some calls to, to and kind of introduce himself before you start to try to go pursue other commits. 
but I get the sense that with Higgins, uh, he, he's a guy who is, you're going to be able to come in and, and balance the line of bringing in talent and also developing some of these younger players because there's been so much talk about what he's been able to do at UVA without being able to go get high ceiling players. And, and, and now you're coming and we have a lot of unknown commodities, but they're former top 24 seven prospects, right? There's a few of those in the room that we're still learning about. So a lot to figure out with this wide receiver room. They bring in Dante Cephas via the transfer portal. They, they bring in Malik McLean, who we talked about a lot in the last episode. Keandre Lambert Smith is still around to provide that experience. And he wants to take that next step. So there is, very much, I think, a, a cabinet to like when you open it up if you're Marcus Higgins here. From a recruiting standpoint, what you're bringing in this summer with Carmelo Taylor, what you've already accomplished on the transfer portal. And to me, he's going to be dedicated to figuring out what the 2024 plan is and developing these really unproven yet high-profile prospects, the kind of which he just did not really often have in that room down in Charlottesville. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing, man. The cupboard that he's walking into definitely is not bare in terms of talent already in the room. He's going to have – a pretty good opportunity to develop some of these guys and get their game to a next level because the room's loaded. I mean, we saw the moves they just made to go out and get Sevis and McLean, and the guy's already in place. It's a high-ceiling room, and I think he's got to be pretty excited about getting to work with that. And, yeah, you talk about you know going out with the 2024s and kind of targeting a higher tier of recruit, I would say, for Higgins down there. That's not a knock on Virginia. It's just the fact of the situation. The Penn State brand is what it is. One high school coach I was talking to in the area was telling me, you put that Penn State logo on his chest compared to what it was in Virginia, you're talking about potentially elite recruiter, just given everything that Penn State has to sell and how attractive kids are to Penn State. So Higgins is going to be locked in on 2024. He's going to be locked in on going out and recruiting a new tier of player, I would say. Guys like Keelan Adams are already in that tier that he's familiar with. And guys from outside the region, you know, names like Chance Robinson down in Florida, St. Thomas Quine has come to mind. Just There are so many possibilities now. And I think we're really going to get to see his recruiting chops on display in a hurry. I wrote this in my morning tidbits this morning. I think, you know, Josiah Brown might be a good little early litmus test for him. You know, how's the relationship come, going to come along with a guy outside of the region for a guy that's been a priority for Penn State and that guy that Penn State wants. So we're going to be keeping a really close eye on Higgins and his relationship. But all, all the early feedback on him is he's going to be able to bond with these kids pretty easily. He's a pretty easygoing guy, yeah. well-respected. I don't think that's going to be much of an issue for Penn State. I think recruits are going to love him. Tyler already has some initial reaction from, from conversations with recruits um, on this move up at lines, 24, com. It'll be feedback that continues in the spring ball. We'll ultimately get feedback from the players in the field, from their on field experiences with him. As we get to know Marcus Higgins. And I should have probably mentioned this at the top of the show, my anticipation folks is that we'll probably get uh, Higgins for some kind of a press conference setting with Penn state media within the next couple of weeks. It may coincide with that February signing day, but that's typically how it has worked when they've brought a guy in in January. And quick note, because someone who was brought in uh, in January was Phil Troutwine. Something he told us when in his initial press conference was he found that guys were responding to his texts and picking up the phone with a little more excitement and fervor now that he was working on behalf of Penn State than on behalf of Boston College. He hadn't yeah. changed as a person. But the, the, the brand that he was working with did, and that just changed for Marcus Higgins for the first time in his career. So we'll see what he can do with that. There is something I want to get to before we talk about uh, some other recruiting items here is a new addition to the running back plan for 2023, which is a, a, it's a walk-on situation. They call it a run-on, I should say. But in this particular instance, you're looking at a spot. We've talked about it in depth. Two scholarship guys currently on campus. That's going to remain the case until the summer. Uh, then you've got a couple kind of wild cards in this freshman class. London Montgomery uh, tore an ACL last August. We won't know where his recovery is. It's tough ask to, to, to ask a lot of him in year one coming off a situation like that. And then you're bringing in Cam Wallace out of Georgia, really a, a viewed as a multi-position kind of prospect at the high school level. I love what he could potentially be for you, but can he be a real balanced running back right now if you needed him to be? We got another name to throw in that mix, and, and I'll let you introduce him to the folks out there. Yeah, Ta David Kensey Jr. from Louisiana. This is a very interesting get to me for Penn State. It really caught my eye last night. So they got him on campus last weekend. Last weekend, Penn State used its junior day to get a lot of its top remaining preferred run on targets on campus or visit, you know, get FaceTime with them. Kensey Jr. was one of them, and he decided Happy Valley was the place for him. So – He's listed at about 5'9", 180. He might be a little bit smaller than that, but frankly, it doesn't really matter to me because, man, this kid can run. If you just watch his tape, I mean, the speed is just – it pops. And I'm not, we're not just talking about a guy who takes jet sweeps, gets to the edge, and beats everyone. He, he's showcasing this speed 
between getting between the tackles and get into the step again into the second level. So I think that speaks to what he's capable of. And I think he's got a kind of he's got an opportunity a lot of walk-ons really wouldn't have coming in as freshmen. So if you, we talk about London Montgomery and his torn ACL, you know, he's going to be rehabbing. You don't really know what Cameron Wallace is at this point. You know, he's got to add some mass. You know, what's his, what's his role going to be as a freshman? Is he a gadget guy? Can you trust him with those carries between the tackles if he needs to take them? And there might be some opportunity for some playing time as an RB3 behind Katron Allen and Nick Singleton. You know, it's an opportunity for him to come in and make some noise right off the bat. A lot of walk-ons don't really get that chance. And to be completely honest with you, kind of surprised that some group of five programs didn't call here. Now, just watching the tape, I'm thinking to myself, this guy's an FBS player. I think he could be on scholarship somewhere. So Penn State, I think they added a pretty quality back to their room. Well, J1 Sider is signing off on bringing a preferred run on from Louisiana all the way up here. I'm going to buy into it until proven otherwise. And and we've seen you know, walk-ons play a role here and there. And and, and Tank Smith uh, got got some run in the Rose Bowl. We thought we might see Kevon Lee. It didn't happen. He's now in the transfer portal. Tank Smith uh, is still on this roster. Emil Davis was an addition as a walk-on last year. So is Tyler Holsworth. Those guys will be involved with spring practice. But at this point, uh, it certainly seems like the latest walk-on addition here in David Kensey Jr. out of Louisiana, he's not going to fall behind any of those scholarship freshmen in his class in terms of reps on the field. Uh, so just a name to monitor here in the running back room, which um, the plan if you're Penn State is to have a very healthy k Allen and a very healthy Nick Singleton for another 13 games. Doesn't always go according to plan. Yeah. So you got to have a backup uh, that you can trust, and probably a few of them if you're in a really good spot. Uh, turning attention, uh, but still into the 2023 class, uh, Chindi Ono uh, is now locked in for his decision date. Where is Penn State? Because he's still working his way through other visits. He was on, on Penn State's campus now about 10 days ago for his official. And what do you make of the timeline here? I still give Penn State a slight advantage over Michigan State and Ole Miss. He had a good official visit with Michigan State last week, and Michigan State really played up. It's an I.O. pitch. I think that's a factor here. I don't know how much of a factor, but, you know, I think that was something that caught Ono's attention. And he's going to be at Ole Miss this weekend for his official, and we all know Ole Miss can do the same kind of thing in the NIL department when it comes to its pitch. But fact of the matter is Phil Troutwin has probably the best relationship with Ono of those two programs, I, I think – that Penn State has pushed really all the right buttons with him since it kind of thrusted itself into the middle of that race. The official visit went really, really well. You know, the feedback from that was all positive. And like I said, it's not a done deal. And also, I can't be remiss, I can't forget Rutgers. Rutgers got him on campus before the early signing period, almost gave him reason to sign and, you know, bring an end to his recruitment despite being a late riser. So I don't think you can really discount Rutgers in this recruitment either. But I think right now the stars are aligning for Penn State. It's definitely not a done deal. He, you know, he's still got a lot of thinking to do after that Michigan State visit, and Ole Miss is going to give him something to think about. So I'm still leaning that Penn State has a slight advantage. We're going to have to see what kind of buzz comes out of the Ole Miss visit because you just don't know. A guy gets down to SEC country, he has an NIL pitch. You know, what's it going to be? But right now, as things stand today, I'd give Penn State the slight advantage. That's a 2023 offensive tackle, a four-star prospect by 24-7 sports assessment. A 2024 offensive tackle from a familiar high school in Pennsylvania picked up a Penn State offer following his visit for a junior day last weekend. You caught up with Caleb Brewer, and it's always interesting when, I mean, we talked about this, uh, we talk about it time and time again, when you go back to the well, one cycle after signing a guy, and that experience went really, went really uh, well for both parties. It always leads you to believe that there's going to be some motivation uh, to get it done again, and Caleb Brewer step on up. Yeah, so, you know, Penn State had been evaluating Brewer for a while. He'd been under consideration for an offer for a while, and the staff really was just waiting for the right time to issue the offer. They wanted to get him on campus for that junior day. James Franklin wanted to deliver that good news in person. And, look, I mean, why I'm missing is a school that Penn State just had success with with Javen Williams, right? You know, they want to keep the best players in Pennsylvania. I think Franklin has an inclination to do that with Brewer and Ryan Corey as well from Pine Ridge who picked up an offer. Yeah. So these two, you know, we're going to be keeping an eye on them as in-state guys. They might not necessarily be at the top of the board right at this moment, but we know Penn State's philosophy when it comes to recruiting in-state guys. That offer usually doesn't go out unless they're under at least serious consideration. So Brewer and Corey, names to know for sure. Ryan Corey, that, that's a name that stood out to me because I watched him um, during the, the, I think it was a June camp. 
And it was Anthony Donko, who's now on campus as a freshman. Alex Birchmeyer, who's now on campus as a freshman. And they were working with Phil Tratwine, and they were periodically bringing some other prospects. And you could tell they were trying to get a sense, you know, for, for maybe who was scholarship worthy. It was Phil Tratwine keeping a close eye. Ryan Corey spent maybe a half hour under that supervision. You know, he rejoined everybody else. I was keeping an eye on that weekend. Was he going to come away with an offer? It didn't happen. He works his way through his junior year. And, you know, it, it just goes to show that that – it doesn't always happen at the same time for these guys. I think we always look, if a guy doesn't get that offer during the summer before his junior year, is he going to get it? And here we've seen a few of those kind of situations pop up in mid-January ahead of the spring, which is where guys are going to be on the road again, trying to decide between official visits. And I feel like this is especially in state, Tyler, and, and this goes for any program. It's kind of make your move or don't. I mean, it's either make your move or risk being the team that let the hometown, uh, that the home state kid uh, get away. Because if you don't make your move and you do it later in the process during the kid's senior season, you better hope he really likes your brand because he may feel like what took so long and that hurts and that sticks with a guy into signing day. So I think the timing of this makes sense. It's still early enough in the process where no feelings should be hurt. And you've got a long way to go to still build relationships and get guys acclimated with your program with upcoming visit opportunities. Yeah, it's a good point. And I do, I do really think it's a case by base case by case basis with kids. Cause I remember um, with London Montgomery, there was a lot of talk about the Penn state offer him too late in his process. Cause he didn't right. really get his until the spring of his junior year. And there were, you know, he had already had longstanding relationships with other schools and there was talk of did Penn state wait too long. And obviously that wound up, you know, not being the case. They got the commitment in the end. And yeah, you know, there are certain in-state kids you want to pounce on. There's certain, you know, you want to kind of go through their junior year and see how they develop. Not everyone's Kevin Haywood, right? Not everyone's going to get that offer right out of the camp performance. Brewer and Corey were guys the staff really evaluated hard throughout their junior year. And like I said, they want to get them on campus in this January in person, deliver that offer. They, they, I think that was some added meaning there from the staff, specifically James Franklin wanted to deliver that good news in person. So I think that kind of speaks to how they view the in-state philosophy and the importance of offering in-state kids and being after them. And then another new offer and, and another new target that you were able to catch up with following that opportunity was Devin Baxter, uh, a, a product out of the DMV down in Maryland, uh, Gwynn Park High School. He's an edge rusher, part of that 2024 class. Uh, what stands out early about this? Uh, you know, we're always looking where the edge rusher process, uh, prospects in the region because – by the end of the cycle, it feels like they are such a dime a dozen, not a dime a dozen. It feels like they are such a rare spot to, to find one of those guys, unless you're taking a chance on kind of one of those late risers, like a Joseph Mapoye type. Yeah. I think Baxter's size popped Penn State. He's listed around 6'6", 230. And, you know, granted, he might not be 6'6", but he's a big kid. He, he's big. He's, he's long coming off the edge, and he's got a good first step. Penn State's the best, not the best, excuse me, the first bigger school to offer, for lack of a better word. So I think getting in early there is going to be big. You know, they want to get him to campus. He wants to get to campus sooner rather than later. I think he's looking at March. He told me he's not really sure. Has to figure out his schedule. He's kind of figuring out if he's going to be able to make any visits anywhere this weekend. I think Penn State's under some consideration there. But he's geared more towards the spring. Really excited about the offer. His main point of contact so far has been Anthony Poindexter, and he really likes Dex. He was praising him. And just the knowledge that Dex has been able to provide him with the defensive scheme He's getting to know John Scott Jr. a little bit. So a name to monitor. I think he will be up in the spring. And, you know, we'll see where that relationship goes from here on out. And then uh, one more name I wanted to get to specifically as well. And, and fittingly, we'll, we'll work our way back into Virginia. Uh, Salem High School's Peyton Lewis was on campus as well for the junior day on Saturday. Spent a bunch of time with Jay Wan Sider. Uh, had the family on campus as well. Ends up going home as a new target on the board for the 2024 cycle at running back. And uh, what stood out from your conversation with Lewis? He was really just blown away with pretty much everything throughout the day. And then, and then he ends it with the offer. So he was kind of like, wow, the word he used with me was starstruck. I mean, just walking around campus, seeing the facilities, seeing Beaver stadium, being around the coaching staff. It was a really big thing for him. You know, he was really blown away with the entire day. And he's a little bit bigger of a back. He's around six one one ninety. I think Penn State likes his size. He told me that Penn State's going to be pretty much, you know, under heavy consideration for him moving forward. So we talked a lot about Duke Watson entering the weekend. He wound up not making the visit. Peyton Lewis, running back, does make the visit and leaves with an offer. So that just goes to show, you know, the fluid nature of a board and, you know, how, how guys come and go and who becomes a priority and who doesn't. And Lewis is very, very excited about this offer. 
I'm glad you brought up Duke Watson not getting to campus. It happens. Uh, you know, we, he's a guy that we discussed last Thursday. By the time Saturday came around, his plans had changed. It happens, and and I'll put it out there. It's Tuesday, but I yeah. think this is going to be the only time we get you on this week. There's another weekend coming up. It's early. With that disclaimer out there, what stands out to you? Because you were t- we were talking midweek last week about what was left in the tank for Penn State here in January, and you said this upcoming weekend, that one has a little bit more juice. So that's a few days away now. Yeah, and the juice is still there. I, this list coming together is pretty impressive. You know, you got Ben Robeck from St. Edward in Ohio. He's a top O-line target. He's going to be on campus. He's got the crystal ball reading Michigan right now. So Penn State's really excited to get him on campus, get a crack at him. In 2025, you got Jalen Matthews, who's a top 100 tackle from Tom's River. They're high on him. He's high on Penn State. So another opportunity to keep further in a relationship and building early with a recruit. And then under center, man, you can't forget about Mike Van Buren. He's making his way back to campus. He's been around plenty. From St. Francis Academy, he's going to be coming back up this weekend. So those are just some of the headliners. You know, that's just a little bit of a taste. We got a lot of good guys coming this weekend. So we're going to keep updating that on Lions 24-7. But this is going to be a big weekend in Happy Valley. Penn State's going to have some of its top guys on campus. And Kenny Wosley is another one who just comes to mind from Imitep in Philly. He's going to be around. He's he, he has Penn State in his top 10. He's going to be narrowing down a little bit soon, I believe. He's closing in on a top five. So good opportunity for Penn State to get him on campus. Just we're going to keep adding names, man. And, it's going to be a busy weekend in State College. We're going to have it all for you. Yeah, strong way to close January for Penn State. It has been an eventful month, to say the least, starting it off out in Pasadena, ending it with a new wide receivers coach now, some transfer pickups, a bunch of freshmen on campus, and now all eyes in this 2024 class. They'll be represented again come Saturday. Between now and again, it's only Tuesday afternoon, and these are the yeah. names that are off the top of the head. So a long way to go. Follow the coverage from Tyler Calvaruso and company at lines247.com. Tyler, always a pleasure. Talk to you soon on the podcast, my friend. Looking forward to being back, man. All right, take care. Big thanks to my colleague from Lions247.com, Tyler Calvaruso, who hops on this podcast pretty frequently. Uh, Hopefully, listeners come to appreciate his insight over the past several months. And then big thanks again to Jackie Franchuli for joining us to to break down the new edition. Marcus Higgins uh, revealed as Penn State's receivers coach on Monday morning. A bunch of coverage on that at Lions247.com, including Mark Brennan's rundown of things everyone should know about this new assistant coach on Penn State staff. And Tyler Calvaruso has early takeaways from the recruiting trail about how this edition is resonating uh, across the region. Uh, Stay with us at lions247.com. We'll have another episode of this podcast a little bit later here in the week. For now, stepping aside and broadcasting from southern New Jersey this week, I'm Tyler Donahue.